I'm Mehdi Jazairi. I'd like to welcome you to the first session of the, well, second session of the uh, Leaders Workshop this year uh, at ECSS. We are happy to have you here and there and everywhere. Uh, this is an unusual uh, workshop. We have had the Leaders Workshop called earlier, was called the Dean's Workshop annually for many years from the beginning of ECSS and it's always been a very lively uh, interactive discussion with lots of uh, networking opportunities among participants and uh, this year of course it's, it's unusual and very different we'll see how uh, we can um, we can take advantage of the opportunity that uh, COVID has provided us. Um, when we started talking about, each year we uh, begin discussion of what topics we should cover in, uh, uh, in, uh, in this workshop. And we often try to find topical issues that would uh, help us introduce some practical guides, practical issues for uh, for the leaders who, who join and, and are both trying to um, open their own discussions with people and also take back some, some lessons from, from the workshop. Uh, this year, uh, when we started discussing it, of course, there was a little bit of uh, um, issue with the virus. At that time, it was in China only. Uh, and... Uh, we did think about, well, should we talk about possibilities of uh, uh, teaching under circumstances like a pandemic? But uh, it didn't seem like, uh, it, it, you know, it may be a temporary issue. And we did not want to consider something that by the time we have the conference, it would not be an issue at all. Well, um, it is an issue and you know, everything has changed. So um, in a way we are lucky that we have the topic that we can address that hopefully uh, will be helpful to everyone. Um, at, um, in thinking about how this issue has come and changed things, for me, I have a personal experience that I would like to tell you about. Uh, in, in Lugano, uh, we started the Faculty of Informatics in 2004. And one of the founding principles was what is really important for informatics professionals is the ability to teamwork and work with, uh, with colleagues and clients and be able to communicate with people. And one of the things we wanted to do is from the beginning, from first year students, work on the issue of teamwork and you know many people have talked about how to teach about teamwork it's kind of difficult but um, but we went so far as even designing a building which forced uh, students graduate students professors staff everyone to be housed together in one building close to each other and from the very beginning we wanted first year students to be close to the teaching assistants who were the graduate students, PhD students and professors, and to have projects from the very beginning where people work together. Now I, now I realize that we, the, we relied on the fact that people worked physically together. Uh, we had tables designed that allowed professors and PhD students and, and students to work, sit around the table together. And uh, I never imagined that uh, teamwork meant um, that, we, that we had to work without physical proximity. And now it's, um, well, this has happened and it's, uh, this is really diametrically opposed to how we started thinking about our faculty. I wonder how much, um, how much effect uh, this um, pandemic has had on, on the rest of us. I mean, obviously it has changed 
a lot of things, including work in teaching and research. And um, well, that's the work we are trying to go to to discuss today. And it will be interactive. The idea is we will have uh, uh, some keynote keynote speech speeches. And um, mm, yes, and uh, we will then uh, follow with uh, a discussant. Some um, Professor Elisabetta Dinito will discuss. Uh, her experiences with reference to the keynote speeches. And then we will uh, break out into three sessions in which we will together discuss and come up with issues. And um, we will get back together at the end and, and review and reflect on, on what we have, uh, we have discussed together. Um, um, as I said, um, we um, um, we start. I mean, in my oh, should I go over the Zoom um, the Zoom rules, please? Uh, yeah, just uh, make sure that if you want to to speak and uh, interact with us, raise the electronic uh, hand under participants so that we know who is trying to talk and and into and bring you into the discussion. Um, so, as I, as I said, uh, in my experience, um, we were really relying on close proximity of students to faculty and, and other researchers. Um, but um, we are lucky to have today as our speakers, Professor Arosha Bandara and Bashar Nosebe, who have been working at the Open University, which um, let me, um, the Open University is and has always been since its inception 50 years ago, a distance education university. And uh, they have lots of uh, experience. They um, not only in, in the UK, but all over the world. And Professor Nasebe is also uh, associated with uh, University of Limerick at the Lero at the University of Limerick, which has several institutes geographically distributed. So we are very lucky to have them uh, talk about their experiences and give us some words of wisdom about what lessons they have learned that we can um, we can uh, take part in. Uh, following their discussion, Professor Elisabetta Dinito will talk about the experience on the continent, as, uh, as they say. Uh, so um, now, before we go on and to get you involved in the discussion, I would like to run a little poll to get you to respond. And we will get a feeling for how, uh, um, what your experience is and what we might uh, build upon and also to get you thinking about the issues that might be affecting all of us. So does everyone see the, the poll? Okay. You have just to remember that people need to scroll down because there are more questions. Right, there are two sets of questions. So uh, fill in your, your vote and scroll down all the way down. And, and I believe you have to submit. And then there will be a couple more questions after, after this one. So once, once you answer, you have to end poll to get the second one. You see that there are still people voting. Let's leave a little, a couple of mm -hmm. minutes, seconds, mm -hmm. there are 20 people, 21. You see that uh, there are more right. people. 22, yeah. yeah. Should we close the poll because I saw that? I think so. A few people voting more. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah. In the results, Maddie will comment on them? Uh, afterwards, after. So we will share them after the um, keynotes. Okay. And now, without further ado, let's go to the UK. I assume that's where you are. <laughs> and Bashar and Ashur Arosha will be giving the keynote. 
Thank you very much, Mehdi, for that for the introduction. Um, I'm not 100% sure I can actually manipulate the slides, so it may be that Arosha will have to uh, do that because we are giving a joint presentation um, in the spirit of collaboration and, and the groupiness and intertwining and all that. So, so I'm not sure. Um, I think, I think I, Arosha said that he, he will do that. So Arosha will, um, or no, maybe, I'm not sure. Let me just check. Yeah, no, I, I can't manipulate the slide. Well, so anyway, I, I'm uh, Rosh and I've sort of uh, gone through the slides together. So, um, so thank you very much for the invitation. Hello, everyone. I hope you're all safe and healthy. Um, it's just really quite frustrating because when I speak, I like to to move my hands and move up and down the stage, and so you're missing a huge part of the the, the presentation effect. Um, the one fortunate thing for me is that I don't hear your groans and, and I don't, <laughs> don't see your eyes shutting and closing and, and the snores and all of that. So hopefully that it's, it's a good compromise. Um, a few years ago, if we'd been asked to give this kind of talk, um, we would have probably been, we would, would have been a very niche presentation um, as, as, you know, distance education, particularly the flavor that the Open University runs is, is not something that most people would, would be set up to, to give. Um, and, you know, most people would have their slides online and, and they, they don't have the, the infrastructure that, that the Open University has. So um, in many ways, when COVID hit, um, for us, um, this is business as usual, to be honest. There's not a huge amount of, 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 of difference. Um, of course, we've had to cope with a lot of different ways of working that, um, that our institution has had to adapt because of COVID. But in many ways, um, this is what we've been doing for, for many, many years. Um, so I think what we'd like to do in this talk is to give you a flavor of the kind of things that we do, what, what has been working for us in terms of give, delivering distance education, um, but also some of the challenges that, that we're facing as a university, trying to move to the next phase where perhaps many more universities are also engaged in this kind of, uh, th this kind of delivery of, of educational materials, which for us also poses some interesting challenges, but possibly some existential ones as well. Um, the, the, the title of our talk um, has the word academia in it. And even though this session is about teaching, um, most of us as academics actually do research and teaching. And so we didn't feel that it was appropriate purely to separate the teaching from the research because the groups that we belong to are sometimes teaching groups, sometimes they're research groups, and sometimes it's a combination of the two. So what we'd like to do is to talk about both of those experiences um, um, in, in, our, in our presentation. Um, there's quite a lot of emphasis on, on these days on, on digital online delivery as opposed to physical physical education. Um, but, but in fact, actually, we're not going to be talking about educational technologies and, and digital technologies. What we want to talk about is um, the educational experience um, that is distributed and ge geographically distributed um, and how we cope with that, um, perhaps at a social level as much as, as a technological level. So if Arosha, if you could uh, move to the next slide and maybe uh, maybe the full slide I think is probably better. Um, so what, what we'd like to do is to tell you a, a little bit about our own organizations, both in terms of the distance education that we deliver and also how we deliver distributed research. Um, because, because for um, b both the Lira Center is a is a is a distributed research center across Ireland, and 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 we also collaborate between the two universities, so between Lira and the Open University. Um, and as I said, the themes that we're going to try and cover, and I'm delighted that uh, Mehdi mentioned this at the beginning, is in, is the role and notion of groups and how we can exploit and make use of groups, um, why those groups exist, so the values that underpin those groups. Um, and what it means for those groups to, to interact with each other and for people to interact with each other. So this notion of intertwined spaces and how we work ac across digital, physical, and across uh, teaching and research um, uh, sort of is one of those themes that we'll discuss. Um, but there are so some, some big elephants in the room in terms of how we, how we deal with, with, with some of the challenges. And, and those are to do with scale and personalization. Um, so increasingly online, um, online teaching seems to offer the ability to reach many, many more people, and that's great, but also needs, need, needs some management, um, particularly in terms of making sure that we deliver a personalized experience for, for, for students as well. 
Um, so, and we'd like to end with a few takeaways that we hope we can actually move to the breakout rooms and then try and get you perhaps to discuss some of these takeaways in, your, in the context of your own universities and your own, your own educational settings. So that, that would be the outline. So if we could go to the next one. So, so, so as, as Mehdi said, uh, one, one of my affiliations is to work for Lero, this Irish Software Research Center. And you, do, you don't need to worry about the numbers on the left, but the, 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 the main message is that it is a virtual center. It covers all of Ireland's universities um, and several of its um, technological institutes. So by definition, it's multi-organization, it's distributed and it's a national center. So conducting research in this, in this context is, is more than just about setting up the building, although it does, as you see, have a building that is based at the University of Limerick. Actually, most people have always been working in their own institutions across Ireland. So, so the geographical distribution of the research team has always been part of what we do. Um, and, and that's an interesting context in its own right. And um, the next slide is, I believe, Arosha's. Yeah, that's right. Thanks very much, Bashan, and thank you to Mehdi and, and the organizers for, for inviting us to, to give this talk here today. Um, so I come uh, from the Open University uh, in the UK, and I just want to give you a little bit of context of ourselves as an organization. So I think it was mentioned before that we are, we've just turned 50 years old last year, and, and throughout that time, we have always been a distance learning institution. Uh, so I'm currently the head of school for computing and communications uh, at the Open University. Uh, so I work with a whole uh, very diverse academic community uh, that includes um, faculty members, but also uh, tutors and then our research students and so on, uh, supporting them to deliver the OU's mission, which has actually also uniquely been a consistent mission since the day we were founded. So our mission as an institution is to be open to people, places, methods, and ideas. Um, and that openness really speaks to um, our identity. And I'll talk a little bit more about how that then feeds into some of the values that underpin how we deliver teaching. Um, and as a university, uh, we have uh, grown and, and achieved quite a significant scale of operation as well. So we have upwards of 170,000 formal students we operate across all four of the UK's uh, four nations, but also we have students who join us from across Europe uh, and further afield uh, as well. Um, and one of the key unique features of the Open University is that we are open access. So we have no formal entry requirements for any student who wishes to uh, study uh, in higher education, whether that's at undergraduate level or postgraduate level. And in fact, more than two thirds of our students uh, enter with uh, only the qualifications um, that uh, high school leavers at age 18 would have. So minimal, what we call advanced levels, so only two advanced level qualifications. Uh, the majority of our students are already in work uh, and they're often working in uh, environments that are linked to their area of study. Although for computing and communications, uh, career change is one of the significant motivators as well. So we, we do have quite a lot of students who are not currently in computing jobs uh, or uh, network technology or IT jobs, but would like to move into that field. Um, and uh, in terms of our community, so in, in the STEM area more broadly, we have about 61,000 students. In computing uh, this year, we'll have about 15, 16,000 students uh, enrolled with us. Uh, and they'll be studying at various various levels of uh, intensity. Uh, some actually choosing to study full-time, uh, others taking advantage of the flexibility that we offer uh, through part-time uh, distance learning uh, to, to study uh, at, a, at a more gentler pace. Uh, but typically our students will finish uh, within uh, six to seven years um, on, on the whole of an undergraduate program. So I'm going to hand back to Bashar now to talk a little bit more about how we uh, link together uh, our research in this geographically distributed way as well. So yeah, we, we, we're, this is the first time we've tried sort of doing a, a tennis-like match uh, of, of switching from one speaker to the next to remind even ourselves who's speaking, you will have noticed the letter on the bottom left hand of the screen that reminds both of us as well as the audience as to who's supposed to be speaking. So B is for Bashar and A is for Arosha in case you were wondering. Um, so, 
Yeah, when, so so we have two really unusual and uh, unusual institutions. You know, the massive scale of the Open University and and the distributed nature of of, of the Irish of Lira, the the, the research center. Um, and what we've done within that over the last ten years is we've created. Um, so we have we have our own research groups within those two institutions, but we've also tried to build relationships between those two large organizations themselves. And we've done that typically um, by meeting every week online and meeting once a year in, in terms of a conference, but actually created this new research group that cuts across two countries, um, a number of organizations. And um, that particular experience is one of the things that we'll, we, we will talk about a little bit in, um, um, in, 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 this, in this lecture, because I think if your mindset is is not tied to your physical location or is, 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 is um, essentially, um, you're always thinking of collaborating with people who are in another location, then you start putting in place processes and, 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 and structures to allow you to do that. Um, so Arosha, I think if you move. Yeah. So yes, um, so it comes back to me and, and to really uh, get to some of the detail uh, and of, of the topic we wanted to uh, explore today. Um, and one particular facet of that, which is the, the teaching, uh, the, the theme of this particular session is about teaching in a post-corona world. Um, and although we, we want to uh, show this integration between research and teaching, let me start by, by saying some things about distance learning more generally with some specific examples of, of how we do that at the Open University. Um, so one of the key things when we think about distance learning uh, is how we uh, enable these, the dialogue that's needed for learning to take place uh, between academics, um, educators who may be located in one place and then students who may be uh, geographic, geographically distributed um, and you know, not, not together uh, in, in co-located spaces uh, with each other, let alone with, with, the, with their teachers. Uh, and so in thinking about this, one of the key things then we have to think about is how we deliver that learning. Um, and uh, in the past, when we've, uh, you know, as a community, uh, looked at ways of, of taking our uh, teaching online and, and giving students a learning experience that happens online, um, we may have thought of sharing our, our materials, our slides uh, through virtual learning environments uh, like Blackboard or Moodle. Uh, and then increasingly uh, a shift to also deliver uh, our mode of teaching, predominant mode of teaching, which is either lectures or, or tutorials in, in online uh, fora. So, you know, um, either pre-recording our lectures and making them available uh, to students or, or live delivery uh, through video conferencing technologies and so on. Um, at the Open University, uh, because of partly because of when we started in, this, uh, in the journey of uh, providing distance learning, um, we have used a, a very mixed mode of doing that. So we did have the notion of uh, online delivery, but in the days when we started, that meant broadcast television. So at one time at the Open University on our campus, we had uh, BBC Studios based on our campus uh, where we uh, recorded uh, and broadcast uh, programs and even to this day our partnership with the BBC in terms of co-producing uh, programs that support uh, our curricula and also allow us to showcase uh, the research that we do as an institution is, is a key part of uh, how we engage the public uh, and make them uh, aware as part of our mission uh, to, to really educate and engage wider society. Um, but Inherent in that is the recognition that we could not deliver uh, everything that needed to be uh, delivered to students to give them a learning experience purely through that medium. And so the uh, approach of blended learning and something that's been uh, many of you will be aware in your own institutions is an approach that is, uh, is very common and it's what we have advocated and found much success with in delivering uh, distance learning. So to have a combination of materials that are produced using media uh, including print. Uh, so we still, uh, to this day, produce some of our learning materials as printed books, uh, which are shipped out to students every year. So in computing, our, our level one entry module, Introduction to Computing and IT, has an intake of about two and a half thousand, three thousand students a year. Um, and as part of that learning, we, we will uh, ship out 
uh, a whole set of uh, course texts uh, to them. Um, and the reason for that is a recognition that actually uh, learning doesn't happen most conducively using a single, single media of delivery. And for students, the opportunity to move away from the screen and have a physical artifact that they can actually uh, annotate and, and look through and use as a source of reference is, actually, is very useful and important to deal with things like uh, fatigue uh, and maintaining uh, student engagement uh, in the learning experience. So yeah, that, that I think uh, is really important to consider and something uh, that requires uh, time and effort to actually design a learning experience. So a, a key part of our model of distance learning uh, is to actually have formal uh, design processes where we actually think about uh, our students. We, we, we use a persona-based approach to create student personas and then actually uh, well, think about the learning outcomes and then the activities and media we want to use to deliver that learning experience. Um, but one of the challenges uh, in this setting is, of course, not everything that we want to do is about uh, um, an autodidactic kind of experience where we can expect students to read materials or watch videos and just absorb and, and learn what they need to do. Um, we also need to help them develop practical skills. Um, and this is uh, particularly acute in STEM subjects, um, you know, science and technology, but in computing as well, where we want to give uh, students experience and, and exposure to uh, hardware and software that are specialized in nature and the opportunity to experiment with that. Um, and again, our approach there has been to use a, a mixed approach. So we, we have uh, modules in, in the past, uh, more of this, but still uh, something that we, we look at. Um, so modules that actually ship out experiment kits to students. Uh, so when I first joined the OU 14 years ago, one of the early modules I was involved in was a, another level one module, an entry level module, where every student was, was sent a, a, an adapted Arduino board basically that we had uh, customized. Uh, and it gave uh, our level one students an, an opportunity to play with the internet of things uh, sensing things about their environment, writing software that actually uh, responded to the world uh, and, and learn about cyber-physical systems uh, very early on as part of their learning journey. Uh, and now we continue to uh, explore and, and innovate in, in that area to look at ways of bringing uh, laboratory experiences to, to online learning environments. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and another key challenge is how, how you build community. Um, so maybe mention the importance in, in, in his context of how they design their physical space in order to enable collaboration and teamwork. Um, and of course, that is the fundamental need and, and we need to have ways of supporting that uh, when we're working at a distance and engaging with our students at a distance. Um, and part of what we need to think about there is, is the nature of those, uh, the spaces we create and actually how involved we as an academic community need to be or, or even should be in those spaces and, and what we've learned over our uh, period of doing this is you need a balance so you need formal spaces online spaces that students can uh, engage with each other and with us as academics in but you also need to give permission to and, and allow for students to create their own spaces so at the OU uh, for, this, for our uh, STEM student community they run uh, a, a discord server which is their space and we don't really uh, formally engage in that, although many academics are part of that space and, and we, we dip in and, and be part of the conversation. But in the same way as we would have a conversation with a student at a water cooler or in the common room. And then for the learning experience as part of our uh, virtual learning environment, we have online forums and, um, and um, online meeting rooms where, which we would use uh, for that type of community building and activity. Now, all of this happens, of course, in, in, a, in a shifting landscape. Um, and there are three particular areas that uh, you know, I identified as part of the preparation for, for this talk. Uh, and one of them is around the general uh, landscape or, around higher education finance and the policies that sits around that. And, and one of the challenges of distance learning is that this um, need for students potentially to be more flexible in how they learn and what that means is they might shift their study from part-time, sorry, from full-time to part-time. 
and, and current higher education finance doesn't really accommodate that easily. So provision for part-time study uh, in the UK has been severely affected by changes that happened uh, eight years ago. And it's only now there's starting to be an active discussion as to how to address that uh, funding gap for part-time students. Um, there's also the shifting landscape about, uh, of, about the competitive environment. Um, and I'm probably, I'm using a kind of management marketing term, which I, I really shouldn't, but we are a, a community of, of institutions that have distinctive features and are trying to do things in particular ways, whether that's from a content point of view or a delivery point of view. And um, that as we more and more of us move online, uh, there will be greater pressure um, to that, that we're no longer just drawing on the student body around a particular geographic region uh, or, or from, a, from a particular area. And therefore, it, it, the potential for that increase in competition is quite great. Um, and, and we need to be aware that in that shift to online learning, uh, that actually the opportunities that we should be exploring to collaborate rather than compete so that we enrich and increase the quality of distance learning for all of us, uh, rather than running the risk of uh, some uh, major players coming into this space and actually turning distance learning into uh, a less enriching experience and, and affecting that for all of us. And finally, we have the, the shifts in media, and I've already talked about that from, from print to online and so on, that, that needs to be dealt with. Um, so, if I now try to think about this in, in a particular context uh, for the OU, the, the learning experience is, is really, uh, as I see it, around supporting dialogues between uh, academics and, and students. And in the past, this has been predominantly a synchronous endeavor supported by, by, by physical, physical infrastructure. And what we're moving to um, is to try and do this online. And in the OU context to enable this and to enable meaningful dialogues to happen with students, uh, we use uh, teams of tutors. So each of our modules will have a team of tutors who will have responsibility for a small group of students and will facilitate the learning. And so this is what we call supported open learning. Uh, but then of course this creates greater um, avenues and opportunities for dialogue between academics and the tutors and the tutors and students uh, and so on. And in the move to online and the, and the need for greater flexibility, you end up having to think about how uh, those dialogues shift from being predominantly synchronous uh, to, to asynchronous. Um, and then you also have the, uh, the challenge of practical activities, as I said uh, earlier, and at the Open University, uh, one of the things we've invested in uh, heavily over the past uh, six, seven years or so uh, is a facility we call the Open STEM Labs. And, and these are a collection of physical equipment that supports science, engineering, and computing uh, that students can access remotely and actually control and get data from. Uh, so the sciences, for example, have remote observatories um, that are part of the Open Science Lab in computing, we have uh, equipment like Raspberry Pi clusters, um, uh, and we're currently working on robotics. Um, so we have some Baxter robots, which are industrial scale type robots that can be manipulated remotely. And we provide this to students. So that, that's another um, area um, that, that needs attention and, and an example of how, how we go about doing this. Now, as someone who, who leads an academic department in, in this area, one of the key things is about the empowering of colleagues um, at all levels to actually lead uh, in, in, in their particular area. So our academic uh, teaching is not done by individuals, but by teams, we call them module teams. Each module team is led by a module team chair and, and they have a lot of autonomy and, and ability uh, to make decisions about how that uh, delivery of their learning uh, is uh, done most effectively drawing on facilities like the Open STEM Labs and so on. Uh, obviously then working with the program level teams and, and with the whole school uh, leadership team um, as well to, to ensure consistency and so on of experience. Um, and then what underpins all of this are, are the values and that needs to feed into how, how we uh, deliver, uh, develop and deliver the, the learning experience. So for us at the Open University, this is our mission 
And the values that come from that is the support for being flexible, being open, and being inclusive. And, and the, the technological choices we make and the process and systems choices we make uh, very much are, are informed by this. And, and because we uh, share these values with our, with our students and our tutors, uh, that's a very important uh, aspect of how to make these uh, the dialogues that support learning work effectively in, in a, in a um, distance learning context and a shared understanding of these values is really, really important. So that's uh, a little bit about uh, how we've approached uh, teaching at a distance at the Open University and, and hopefully uh, give some ideas and, and, and uh, ways in which uh, yourselves could think about uh, those. One of the key things I think is the shift of the dialogues being synchronous to being increasingly asynchronous and, and the support for that and, and the importance of embedding the values in, in all of the um, technologies and processes that, that sit around that. And then there's the, the link to, to research and, and the importance of recognizing that these academics uh, and uh, are not just doing teaching, but they're, they're part of a research community as well and how that intertwines with uh, how we deliver distance learning. So I'm going to hand back to Bashar to talk a little bit about that now. Uh, thanks, thanks, Arosha. I, I guess um, one of the, all of us will belong to either research groups, departments, centers, or institutes. Um, and so we, we have organizational affiliations to particular groups, um, but we also have multiple groups that we, 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 we are uh, members of as well. Um, you know, we, we can be a part of a teaching group and we can be part of a research group and part of an admin group. And so um, one of the things that we've worked really hard on as, as researchers and, and as, as, as um, academics working in teaching um, is to try and understand these different needs for, for, um, for grouping people and for what, why people form groups. And we've created three types of groups. And maybe, Arosha, if you put all three up and then I can, I can talk to them. Um, so we, we, we recognize that some groups are, are really purely social. They, they are groups for people to be able to talk about, um, to talk about things that are not, not necessarily to do with their academic jobs and, 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 um, and, and perhaps you know, their life outside academia. And um, these are quite important, particularly when you don't have um, um, the physical sort of uh, water cooler or coffee machine. So we, we've been creating th things, what we call kit groups, keeping in touch groups. Um, th these are, you know, assembled because people are interested in them. They, they, there's no obligation for them to talk about work. They're often not non-technical um, and they're very much bottom up and they, they form. But we try and support those groups as independent from um, what the other groups that we might have, which are called working in teams groups or with groups. Um, these are often thematic and functional. Um, they, they, they might be aligned to a particular research project or a particular activity. Um, or a particular research theme that people, uh, you know, a number of people are, are involved in. Um, and these, these are, are useful for people to be grounded in, particularly, for example, students who um, work in a particular area in their PhD and they want to meet like-minded people who want to work, who also um, are thinking about similar problems. And this works on top of any existing structures for, for research projects that might be funded from outside and might, might have a lifetime beyond um, multiple projects. Um, and the last one, which we haven't very wisely named, but they're called spit groups. <laughs> and these are spontaneous interaction groups. And these are created um, in order for us to be a bit more creative, to bring people together who might come from multiple disciplines, um, to work collaboratively to solve problems that they care about. Um, and um, th these can be quite short-lived or they can perhaps get people to come together to write a proposal or to create some new projects um, or to solve particular problems. Um, if, if we move to the next slide, Arosha. And the, the reason um, many of these groups are formed because we have certain values that we want to try and achieve. And again, Arosha, if you could put uh, all of them, I think it's, it's easier. Um, the values that underpin the groups are really what makes these groups successful. And, and actually trying to, to, to think about why you are in a group and what it's trying to achieve is really quite important for, for that dialogue and discussion to happen. So for example, in our research group, um, we, we, we have identified three things that we really care about. So we want to, 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 to work to produce excellent research of, of a high quality. 
Um, we're particularly interested in interdisciplinary research that cuts across, di across disciplines, and we want to work collaboratively. So these are values that we care about as a research group, and it, it defines our modus operandi about how we want to, to, to conduct our research. And we encourage people to always be, you know, so you don't submit a paper unless you think it's high quality. You always try and find complementary expertise and you try and work um, in a safe environment collaboratively with other people. Um, but increasingly, and particularly with COVID, I think it's really become um, very important that we recognize that how people are living their lives affects how they learn and affects how they conduct research and what research they conduct. So we've been developing, and this is based on social psychology research, we've been developing a number of dichotomies of values that we think are important for people to think about when they're, when they're conducting any kind of academic activities. And I've listed them there. So justice and discrimination, well-being and disease, happiness and fear, diversity and integration, sustainability and development, and me versus us. And one of the things that we do when, when we are, for example, sitting in a discussion, we think, um, are, are the values of justice and discrimination being addressed by our research? Does it, is it going to impact our, our well-being or is it going to, to um, um, sort of be cause, cause, cause some, some harm, for example? Is it going to cause emotional, positive emotional feelings or negative ones? And these, these are things that, that, um, that people care about. This is what drives people, that, you know, whether it's happiness and, 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 and ha happiness or well-being or, or the way they live and the environment and so on. And to be able to think about these things and to think about how our research projects and how our, how our teaching teams um, relate to these is often a really strong driver to actually producing excellence and producing interdisciplinarity and producing collaboration, which is what we want to achieve as, as research groups. Um, and we find that students and researchers really are engaged in these kinds of dichotomies. I mean, um, because they feel that their research and their work makes a difference, um, that they don't just want to do it because it is part of the curriculum. They want to do it because they might change the world. And, you know, students are really engaged in, in, in are, are really interested in, in, in doing work, whether it's research or, or learning, that will have an impact on their own futures, their families' futures, and their society's futures. And, we, and this lens of thinking about values, about why, why, you know, why we teach what we teach and why we do research in particular areas um, is I think quite fundamental to a cohesive group. Um, and so in software engineering, for example, now an overarching theme of the entire Lero Center is what we call responsible software engineering. So any project that we try and initiate in Lero we try and ask the people who are working to think about what are the responsibility concerns that might impact, be, might be impacted by their research, the, the responsibility concerns that might be impacted by the use of their research, and um, the responsibility concerns by the way they conduct the research itself. Um, so if we move on, uh, Arosha, back to the next one. And, and, and so, um, 10 years ago, we, we, we started doing quite a lot of privacy research and, and trying to build technologies to support people um, um, manage their privacy. And we came up with, 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 with this layered model um, that actually has, turns out, has an impact not only on privacy, but on building any kind of suitable or choosing any kind of suitable technology. So if you think about the space in which you work, it's really important to understand that, you know, I am geographically in this particular location um, but it's more important to understand um, richer um, locations that have richer meaning to people. So the fact that I'm in London as opposed to a GPS location is more useful than, um, than, than just that GPS location. To know that I'm actually conducting a, a seminar in, for Informatics Europe is more important than the fact that I'm in London. And the fact that I'm trying to communicate something about learning and teaching is more important than I'm doing it to in Informatics Europe. And so the, the, this idea of moving up this, this semantic hierarchy of increasing the meaning of why people are meeting, why they're engaging in research, why they're engaging in teaching is much more likely to help you choose the right technologies for supporting people. And we call this move from spaces to places, um, a move from, from um, um, an, an increase in, uh, in levels of, of, of meaning that, 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 that people can relate to. Um, and I think it's, it's possibly a useful model for people to think about why they've created a particular platform for people to meet. 
Um, and so even though we meet in <laughs> geographically, we meet every every year or every week or so on in, in physical spaces, or sometimes we meet in digital spaces on Zoom, um, it's why we meet and what we do when we meet that really matters to people. And of course, we need to make sure that people are not tired and all sorts of other things, but it's actually this purpose is really key to, to how you put teams together and how you put technologies to support them together. Um, Arusha, the next slide. Um, and so Arusha, I think is now, you know, so it all sounds like a really lovely rosy picture, but of course there are some big challenges that, that Arusha is gonna say something about. Yeah, thanks very much, Bashar. So, um, yeah, the couple of uh, emerging challenges that we wanted to highlight, um, and it's not exhaustive by any means, but I think these are these are quite quite important. So one of them is what um, uh, arrives from the scale and the nature of scale that's achieved uh, in this move to to working uh, remotely and particularly uh, in distance learning or on educating uh, people, delivering an educational experience remotely, um, and. These challenges, of course, also have some associated uh, opportunities. Um, so one is that greater geographical reach, the ability to support larger groups uh, and include diverse perspectives. And, and um, in uh, computer science informatics, we, we see uh, lots of examples of that now happening uh, in the wider world where uh, academics are inviting colleagues from across the world to, to join their um, MSc programs and, and, and deliver uh, visiting lectures that weren't easy to do previously, logistically much harder to do potentially, but now there are opportunities to do that. Um, and it's something at the Open University we've also uh, been doing for, for some time. So when we created some of our uh, level one modules again to, to help students really understand uh, the, the background and context, we, you know, we would go out and uh, interview some of the, the leading uh, people in the field. Uh, I remember we went to um, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. We interviewed Alan Kay about some of the work he had done uh, on, on uh, programming uh, languages and so on. We can go out into industry and, and talk to you know, big companies like Intel or Microsoft as to how, how they actually uh, deploy the knowledge and skills that students learn in their programs and bring that to our students. And, and the, the move to distance learning opens that, those kind of opportunities up for, for more and more people, I think. Um, now, but there are also some, uh, some key challenges that come about, and particularly in, in the intertwining of the distance learning and the, and the, the things you're trying to deliver um, by exploiting the opportunities of scale. Uh, but that the intertwining of those with the values that you're trying to satisfy. Uh, so for one, one example is as, as you increase the, the, the size of your student body, uh, the number of individuals who, who might uh, require special adaptations of learning materials or uh, additional support uh, is likely to increase too. Uh, so for example, at the Open University, we have about 25,000 students, a bit more maybe, uh, who have some form of declared disability uh, and, and require some kind of special adaptation and, and support, additional support around that in order to get them the right equipment and help them select appropriate equipment that can help them in their studies. Um, and so that comes from a value that we uh, are, are very much um, uh, interested in, in, in uh, achieving and, and, and maintaining, which is being open and inclusive, uh, but it has that consequence. Uh, and, and, and we, we choose, because we, we value openness and inclusivity, we, we invest in that. But for, for yourselves and the organizations you're part of, there might be different considerations in play depending on the values you choose uh, to, to focus on. Um, and also you have to recognize uh, with scale that there are limits of economies to, of scale, uh, the communication overheads that come about as you grow, uh, the number of groups you're trying to support and the number of individuals uh, that you have involved and so on. So all of these things uh, need, need to be need to be considered. Um, so I note that there are some chat questions, but I think we'll pick them up at the end if that's okay. Um, and yeah, but I will I will address both of them. Um, the other type of challenge that uh, I wanted to highlight was um, the challenge that comes around enabling personalization. Um, so as uh, distance learning in some, in some ways affords an opportunity uh, to 
have a have a, a direct conversation with individuals. Um, and in fact, uh, again, when I first joined the Open University, uh, when we when we did this work around the student persona, one of the things that uh, I remember uh, being instructed about in that was when you're writing written teaching materials, you are kind of visualizing yourself having a direct conversation with, a, with an individual student and trying to explain things to them. Um, but of course, at scale, that, that's uh, harder to achieve that kind of uh, personalization and, and when people are, are geographically distributed as well. Um, but I think there are opportunities to, to use the, the structures of groups uh, and organization that you create to deliver distance learning uh, to, to exploit those to, to achieve uh, some degree of personalization, um, and uh, that may be around how you how you organize people into groups, not just students, but also your academic staff, and get the right mix of uh, knowledge, skills, and expertise uh, in a group in order to provide effective, uh, personalized uh, support uh, for individuals. Um, but there are also uh, opportunities uh, to explore technological solutions. Uh, so at the Open University, We've developed a tool, uh, tools around learning analytics, making use of the data that we have available about how students engage with their online learning environment and their uh, engagement with assessment activities and so on, which allow us to identify students who might be at risk uh, of not completing a module. And that allows us to target the relatively limited resource we have, uh, considering the scale, uh, to target the, those resources uh, in order to provide appropriate support uh, for a student. And then there are uh, technologies like chatbots and so on, that uh, AI techniques that are also being used uh, more widely uh, to provide uh, some of the support that helps students and, and particularly to answer specific questions that individual students might have uh, more, more easily. So, that's a very high level uh, picture of, of, of a couple of challenges. And I think we'll explore these more in the, uh, in the breakouts. Um, so let me just, just a minute for the sake of time interrupting. Maddie, we are 12 minutes late. Can we, could you please let us know what do we have to do? We tried to reach you, but we, you didn't notice our pink. Maddie? Okay, yes. Yes, we are 12 minutes, 13 minutes now ahead of time. We have one more. Oh, okay, so. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Great. One more. Perfect. So that's fine. Just, just that uh, uh, Medi realized that we are a bit late. Good. Okay. okay. Sorry. That's okay. Um, so yes, uh, I'll hand back to Pasha, who's going to wrap up actually. Yeah. So it, it, it is the final slide, and I blame Medi entirely for his long introduction, um, for, for the delay, of course. <laughs> um, so. so um, <laughs> Well, the, t the takeaway message is really one that I think we've emphasized throughout the, the presentation. Um, the wisdom of groups, shared values and places and spaces. Um, it's really important when you're thinking about teaching and research is to think how you can form and exploit groups. I think that's a really important unit of discourse that you need to you, you think. I think doing it on your own is really hard. Research is hard to do on your own, but also teaching is hard to do on your own. And thinking about ways of forming groups to help you is really important. Um, understanding why you are doing what you're doing, not just in terms of content, but also the things that you're trying to achieve in, in, the, in the social, cultural, political setting that you're doing is increasingly important, I think, in education. And you see that in the, the number of COVID-related projects that are happening, but also you know, the, the, the kinds of discussions around curriculum and what we should be teaching and teaching, um, te teaching you know, responsible AI or, or, or um, you know, how we, how we engineer software responsibly. So those shared values are really critical. And understanding that the notion of a space, if it's digital or physical, is not the, the be all and end all. Actually, it's, it's the notion of a place that really matters and giving meaning to that place is actually what you're trying to solve. And, and, and that will allow you to choose better technologies, better ways of working that allows you to, to understand that richness of the place that you're trying to, to, to live in and work in and, and teach in. So I think those are the three takeaway message. Um, we might consider them a little bit more in the, in the breakout groups. Um, and and uh, yeah, and, and I think the next slide is just says, thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Bashar and Arusha for those wonderful words of wisdom. Uh, 
Let us uh, go to uh, Elisabetta, Professor Denito of uh, Politecnico de Milano, a beautiful place. And she will tell us about uh, her experiences and what they are doing uh, in Milano with uh, some comments perhaps about what uh, our speakers talked about. Yeah. Take it away, Elisabetta. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me. So very uh, quickly, uh, because I think it would be good also to leave uh, space for questions and discussions. Uh, our uh, uh, experience at Polytechnic in Milano starts from completely, almost completely in presence uh, teaching, um, which means uh, that uh, we uh, have historically have started as a, an in presence university and we were strongly as a, and Mehdi was saying at the beginning, we were strongly believing in uh, physical connections between people and in uh, creating, uh, in working uh, all, uh, to, all together and in creating groups, physical groups, uh, studying and working together. So this uh, emergency, of course, has, has changed uh, several things and uh, uh, we had to run very fast uh, to uh, address uh, the problem. So first of all, uh, as, as you know, Italy has been the first place outside, uh, uh, outside China that uh, has uh, been uh, uh, catched by the, uh, by the virus. And so uh, we were at the beginning of our uh, second semester of uh, the previous academic year. And uh, in uh, uh, essentially one week, uh, we had to restructure the whole teaching. So the semester was uh, starting uh, the 22nd of February, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, seven days after this, uh, we started with online teaching immediately. So it, it was kind of hard to, to uh, immediately uh, change everything. But in the end, I have to say that the whole university, I mean, all courses have been able to, uh, to address the challenge in any way or another. And the, the interesting thing is that even those, uh, um, uh, those uh, curricula that are heavily uh, focused on uh, delivering physical artifacts, we have designed, we have architecture, and they have been able also to find their own way uh, to come out with laboratories uh, that uh, uh, even though uh, online were able to uh, to get uh, some res to obtain some results to let the students achieving some results um, so this was the uh, the status uh, uh, between uh, February and uh, and June then we started exams I see that there is a, here a question uh, by Alphonse uh, concerning online exam. Of course, we have been thinking quite uh, for a long time about how to handle exams in an online setting. In the end, uh, uh, we came out with uh, uh, many different solutions uh, and we adapted uh, these solutions to the specific uh, uh, courses uh, that uh, each of us uh, was teaching. So, for instance, uh, in, the case, in the case of uh, uh, the computer science and engineering courses, uh, what we did in most cases uh, was a blending between oral exam, exams given uh, online and uh, written exams uh, done either uh, just uh, on paper with the camera on, uh, microphone on and everything, or uh, with uh, online. So online meaning uh, through the uh, computer using Zoom. We have been using Zoom because it allows us to uh, have multiple people sharing their screens. So we had all students sharing their screens and we were checking their screens while they were working on their exams. And essentially we uh, checked them in this way. At the same time, we asked the students uh, to uh, sign a, um, a code of conduct uh, in which uh, they were committing on not cheating. And I have to say that uh, we did not experience the major uh, situations of uh, cheating uh, through the various courses. So in the end, uh, measuring uh, the, the final results in terms of number of students who passed the exam and uh, types of uh, scores that they got, etc., we did not uh, notice uh, uh, some uh, major changes con concerning comparing the, the, the data with the ones of uh, the year before. 
So in the end, uh, we manage that way, mainly I would say relying on the students and on their honesty. And uh, we, uh, I have to say that that worked. Now this, uh, uh, this semester, we have started uh, with a blended uh, uh, teaching uh, in which uh, uh, essentially we uh, are in the room, in the, in the classroom uh, with uh, those students who can come into the classroom and other students uh, can uh, join us uh, online. Uh, so remotely we have a streaming system uh, and uh, through this system we have cameras of course in the room that can uh, follow what we do and so we can use the blackboard, we can use lights, uh, we can have a mixture between the two uh, and uh, the students at home can interact also uh, through the videos and chat, sorry audio also audio, chat, and video, and sometimes we have also students sharing the screens, etc. So uh, the, the other thing is, uh, uh, the other challenging stuff was uh, laboratories. Uh, as I mentioned before, four uh, computer science uh, laboratories were less challenging than in other cases. Uh, the nice thing is that, uh, at least uh, for instance, in my courses, we have been able to find a way to create uh, small groups uh, of students uh, who were collaborating online um, and uh, uh, we uh, as uh, teachers uh, uh, have been able to go through the various groups online uh, exploiting mechanisms such as the breakout rooms uh, and, uh, uh, and so we noticed that in the end online students uh, seem to become less shy uh, so maybe they are not uh, it seems that for them the, the way uh, of interact this way of interacting with the, with the other students and with teach teachers uh, through chat or through or through audio uh, but remotely uh, is a way to uh, make them uh, uh, more let's say active in the participation it looks strange but this is uh, our experience so what we are planning to do for the future is actually to try to uh, take the best from uh, the in-presence class, which is essentially essential, of course. Uh, we are not saying that it's not essential in our specific context. So it is very important. But at the same time, we have noticed that uh, uh, online has also several advantages. And uh, so the two can be exploited together in a way that we have still to discover. So this is my short summary. But <coughs> Thank you very much, Elisabetta. Um, let's uh, share the poll uh, and uh, then maybe while we're doing that, if uh, people, uh, ha we have time for a couple of questions before we break into the breakout sessions. If you would like, if someone would like to raise their electronic hand and uh, have a question. I see that there are already multiple questions in the chat. Yes, there are. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, I do not have my glasses with me. So it's hard for me to read this question. So if one of the speakers uh, would like to take any of the questions. Yeah, absolutely, maybe. Um, so I did try to uh, respond in the chat as well. So the mm -hmm. first question uh, was relating to forming uh, peer networks and how we encourage, how do we encourage students to to have those informal um, uh, conversations spontaneously getting to know each other, uh, which, is, which is hard. Um, and so you know, part of the response to that is to um, actively support it rather than assuming that it will happen. Uh, organically. And so uh, at, at the Open University, our, our main virtual learning environment uh, supports forums and, and every module team um, will set up a forum called the Cafe Forum and, and there'll be explicit guidance as that's the place you can hang out and chat about anything you like um, within obviously normal moderation guidelines about civility and so on and, and, and not, uh, uh, and not uh, talking about inappropriate topics. But and then what students often do is, is start a conversation there, then that leads to a space that they create themselves, whether that's a WhatsApp group, or as I mentioned earlier, our, our STEM student community has a very 
active Discord server where there's a lot of lot of uh, activity going on, and so students will move those spontaneous conversations into their own space. And again, the the reflection that we've had is it's important uh, to both encourage uh, that, and it's also important not to follow students into their space and start becoming an active participant in that because then you're taking away uh, something that they've created for themselves. Just to add, um, as, as, a, as a teacher or as a research leader, for example, it really does, it is important that you actually expend some effort trying to make these things work. So just creating these groups and hoping that people will, will turn up mm. is not, doesn't always happen. So you have to seed them with either activities or, or maybe put some resources there for, to, attract, to attract people to attend. I know in one of our keeping in touch groups, what we did is we asked people to just bring a photograph of something that is important to them. Um, and then they just come to this to the meeting and then they they have a photograph that they discuss and it seems to be an extremely good icebreaker to, to just re say something personal about why they chose that photograph and then you just leave them and then they, be, they 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 often hang around and talk to each other for long periods of time and you can do that for technical technical um, seeding but also for social seeding as well of conversations okay yeah. maybe can I ask you if your experience about exams, you must have lots of uh, uh, technology that you do about exams. Uh, uh, how do you handle that? Do you, your experience the same as Elisabetta's? Um, to, to some extent, so uh, yeah, again, I, I responded in the chat uh, a little bit about this. So our, our model when we uh, move to exams, so as a university, we still depend on uh, physical exams where students turn up to an exam center and physically write on a paper uh, pre-COVID. That was, that was the situation for, for many modules, particularly in the undergraduate program. Um, so, and picking up on, I think uh, Kim has asked a question about how do you deal with the scale of that? So it's a combination of, so when you have those ex uh, exam papers, we have teams of markers and, and we have a process called coordination where the team of markers will mark a sample and then have a conversation about the marking scheme and that sample to kind of get some calibration and then consistency. And then people go off and mark and each marker will likely mark 30 to 50 scripts depend, depending on, on the scale of the module. And then you, but you have a large team involved in that process. In moving to online, um, we've either taken a module and, and, and looked at its assessment strategy and said, actually this doesn't need an exam and we could set it as a, as a more substantial piece of coursework. And that's quite a lot of what we've done in our postgraduate program is to get rid of the exams we had and then move to a piece of coursework that allows students to do something richer and, and more suited to postgraduate study in some ways. And in the undergraduate space, we have moved to um, what we're calling remote online exams, but they're effectively open book exams. So we're not, we're not doing any remote proctoring or anything like that. We're, we're just formulating the exam in a way that uh, focuses on application of knowledge to uh, problems. And also then we time limit the, the, uh, the available time to the students. So some exams in the, like, the more mathematically oriented exams um, for example, are setting like a four hour time window within which the exam is downloaded, completed and returned for marking. Uh, whereas other, some other modules are adopting a 24 hour window in which students can complete an open book exam and return it. In our okay. case, I can add, uh, actually uh, we usually do open books. Actually we used to, to do open books even in present. Um, so what we do is to do open book in most cases also online, uh, but we give a very short uh, time window. So typically an exam lasts one hour and a half. So uh, you can, it is open book at the, at the same time, you need to know where to look at. So you can study uh, your subject uh, during the exam. Uh, and uh, uh, trying to be as fast as possible, checking what the students are doing on the screen by having them sharing the screen is a way to avoid the uh, cheating. Then uh, you can have some cheating, but in the end, uh, uh, I think that our students, uh, by signing the code of contact that we uh, really had them sign and we have spent a lot of time in explaining them the meaning of the code of conduct, I think that they understood or most of them, then if someone cheats, I mean, 
its life, it can cheat also in presence. But I would say that most students uh, didn't cheat, and probably the more we trust them, the better it is, also for their education, not only for us. And, and maybe just to wave the flag of research as well a little bit, just to say that in edu informatics education research has not always had its, its proper place in computing departments in terms of it's always not it's not always regarded as a first class um, research area which i think hopefully this this kind of uh, situation might might change change um, people's views um for for us at the open university there is a very large natural language processing research group research on education and educational technologies on pedagogies in computer science and i think these are it's an important ecosystem for people who who are thinking of new ways in which to do both teaching and assessments to actually also think of research areas that are relevant to, to this. And so we do quite a lot of research on automated, automated assessments, understanding plagiarism, um, sentiment analysis, those kinds of research areas that I think are quite important. So if people are research department leaders and are thinking of investing in certain topics, then those would be areas that they might consider as well. Okay. Thank you very much. So in the interest of time, and I'm afraid we have to shorten the breakout sessions. So the idea is that we will break into three sessions, um, each one led by one of our speakers. And I think there's something I have to say about do not leave the breakout uh, um, when you are finished. Yeah, it's correct. It's correct. correct. Okay. Yeah. And wait and... Uh, uh, Svetlana will take care of everything. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, people will be kicked out of the whole mm -hmm. meeting. So just. So stay, I'm now stay opening uh, uh, breakout rooms, and you will be automatically assigned to each. Okay. Each each person will be yeah. assigned yes. to to a breakout room. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a good time while you were <laughs> surfing. <laughs> um, so we have we are actually quite short of time, but we will. Uh, Let's take uh, each um, speaker, take a few minutes uh, and summarize any takeaways from your session uh, for the rest of us who were not in your session. And then we will have time for a, a little bit of question and answer session. Let's start with uh, Arosha. Thanks, maybe. Um, so, yeah, I don't think we quite got to, you know, concrete takeaways, but, but we discussed a number of interesting um, issues. Um, so one of them in particular was uh, the importance of uh, building community early and particularly where for, for first year students or students who are just starting in a program, how do we ensure that they have an opportunity to build some uh, social networks outside, potentially even outside their programs uh, so that they have support uh, going forward. Uh, and the observation, the counterpoint to students uh, at my institution at the OU is, of course, they have a working life and a family life that's all part of their day to day existence and therefore it gives them uh, a way to socialize and engage, not necessarily with their fellow students. But for, for those uh, students at, at uh, uh, campus based universities who are now being put into uh, an online learning environment, that may not be the case. So that's a very important consideration. Uh, and we, we discussed the importance of, uh, therefore, proactively providing online spaces for that type of uh, networking and, and community building um, so, that, so that students can get some of that benefit, even though it's not as uh, necessarily the same as the, what they would have in a face-to-face -face setting. Um, we, we also talked about um, the kind of uh, differences between in-person, online, and hybrid models of teaching, and, and Kim in particular shared uh, the kind of experience that, uh, in fact, the, the hybrid model is actually the hardest of the three to really do mm -hmm. effectively because you're, you're, you're trying to serve two separate audiences, part, partly online, partly in the room. Uh, and and um, yeah, I, in, the, in the OU context, uh, we also have face-to-face -face, uh, tutorials and online tutorials, but we don't try to mix the, the two at the same time, uh, because uh, that tends not to work as effectively uh, for either of the audiences. Um, and we also had a conversation about uh, the attitude and prep preparedness of students 
to to change the the way they engage with their studies. Uh, so again, you know, the proactive student, who you know, the, the typical student who comes to part time distance learning uh, in the past would would have always, already have some motivation and and a, a proactive streak within them because that, that motivates them to engage and, and study in that particular way. Uh, but for students who are not used to that and who might need help moving from a more passive approach to learning to be much more active. Uh, that's a challenge that we, we need to look at and uh, figure out ways of um, addressing, but also recognizing every student um, every student is different. So that's not a, uh, a universal experience uh, as, as Jesper was uh, sharing with us in, in our breakout. I think that kind of covers the, the three main things. There were a few other things we discussed, but uh, yeah, those were the ones we focused on. Okay. Great, thank you. So maybe let's go from A to B, Bashar. <laughs> thank you. So it's always very dangerous to start with Arosha because he's an amazing moderator of these meetings. So he's got a long list of things we discussed. I think we discussed maybe two or three things or at least the questions were asked. Um, what, one of them was the issue of engagement. And um, we, we discussed this whole notion of, of, of space and what does it mean in concrete terms to have a mm -hmm. cyber physical space. And why, and then Paolo was asking also, why is it different from just normal places where we sit in a workshop and we're on the laptop mm. and just the other way around? <laughs> um, and I think it's not that we, we were sort of, we discussed the fact that it might not be that different, but we just need to somehow recognize that it needs management slightly differently. So you might be on an online meeting and you might have a physical break to do something outside and then come back to it to try and keep the, the you know, to keep fresh and, and engage with the, with, with, with the topic a little bit. Um, um, I think there was a reiteration of the problem of scale, that this is really hard. It's okay to do all these nice fancy things with groups if you're 30 or 40 people. But, um, you know, the question is, what do you do when, when you have 100 or over 100? And one of the areas we, dis we, we talked about is perhaps that there needs to be more research on scale, of course, whether, whether various kinds of, whether it's adaptive systems research or natural language processing, to help us a little bit understand how we can have more targeted interventions to help people within a very large, um, with a large body of students. And the last question that we, we didn't really have enough time to cover, but what was asked as a question, which is our health when we are online for so many hours of, of so mm. many days, and particularly for younger, you know, for younger children, for example, engage in this. I think Claudio was saying that, uh, you know, it's really hard for, you know, children start complaining of having headaches and, 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 and it's, it's really difficult to concentrate. And then you get actually more disengagement rather than engagement if you don't do it carefully. So, so this question of engagement has to be studied on, at the same time as disengagement. And, and I think, again, there's no, there's no obvious answer, but I think having groups that have shared values, in my view, might, might be something that allows us to, to consider health as a first class uh, objective of your group and not just the technical uh, goals of the meeting. Okay, let's skip the C and D and go to Elisabetta with E. <laughs> well, Denito. Yeah, okay. So D. Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So in our case, I think that uh, yeah, uh, we discuss something that has been already touched uh, by Arosha and Basha. So, uh, for instance, about uh, engagement, uh, and uh, so the the point was uh, uh, that uh, we need to keep the students engaged. Uh, into the course, but not only into the course, uh, into a specific course, but also uh, to make sure that they understand that uh, they the live in the environment in which they are uh, learning that is not uh, only built uh, around a specific topic, but is uh, something that is uh, uh, much, uh, uh, let's say, has a broader scope than a specific topic. Uh, so the point is understanding how to uh, to make sure that all students uh, uh, understand this environment and uh, uh, get engaged with the, not only with the topics that are taught, but also uh, with the uh, ideas that are behind these topics and the philosophy of the uh, uh, and the approach, the, the the approach that uh, we want to teach to them, and in that in many cases we teach uh, by uh, uh, by examples, by trying to make them follow specific examples and specific role models. The other thing is also, was also to understand how to catch uh, students with difficulties. So assuming that you have a large uh, class, uh, 
uh, in which uh, there are students uh, who interact and others uh, who don't, how to understand where the students uh, who don't interact are and whether they have difficulties or they are simply, uh, um, their attitude is simply not to, uh, not to interact. Also connected to the engagement, there was uh, the, the idea that uh, we cannot uh, replace uh, coffees you know, and coffee machines with, uh, um, with some uh, digital uh, uh, coffees, but at the same time we can find uh, things that are as engaging as uh, uh, coffees uh, and that work well uh, in, a, uh, in a digital context. So, so for instance, uh, having students uh, playing games together could be a way to, uh, and especially if the games are somehow related to the topic that they have to learn, uh, this could be, uh, could be useful and could be beneficial uh, to them. The other thing that we discussed uh, was, uh, yes, but then uh, do we need uh, to uh, just uh, uh, understand that we are not anymore going to have a, a physical class or a physical conference and that everything is going to be to be run uh, using uh, Zoom or a similar uh, system. And uh, I guess that in the end, the conclusion was that uh, we need to find the right blend between uh, physical and online. So online has several advantages, uh, but of course uh, it doesn't replace uh, physical. Uh, and it needs, uh, uh, as, uh, um, as also Bashar was saying, a specific, uh, uh, a specific care uh, to be managed in a proper way. So we cannot really replace uh, digital with, uh, uh, with physical, uh, assuming that the, inter the interaction approaches and uh, uh, remain the same. So the two are complementary and we need to understand this complementarity and uh, to use uh, the best uh, approach in uh, uh, adapting it to the specific situation. Another point that was made uh, was concerning, that is also related to what, to what Bashar was saying about the health of people uh, looking at the screen, is uh, how long a lecture should be. Uh, in, uh, in my experience, at Polytechnico, we are very, you know, we are technical people, we don't care, three hours <laughs> lectures, and that's all. <laughs> but yeah, uh, as uh, Basha was saying, probably uh, this is something that we need uh, to understand better. Uh, and also to uh, frame in a general context in which the students doesn't have only one three hours lecture, but maybe he has two three hours lectures plus something else during the day. So this is something that probably we need to discuss. Okay, I hope I have summarized the all points. Okay, so maybe uh, I uh, it just occurred to me since you're talking about hybrid and also health, Bashar said, I just share with you, I heard uh, um, a neighbor of mine, her, her daughter is in a school where the teacher is remote, but the students meet in a classroom with a proctor. That way they are protecting the teacher from possibly getting uh, uh, sick because if the teacher gets sick, the whole class is offline. But if a student gets sick, well, there's only one student. Uh, so it's a trade-off that I had never thought about, but uh, this seems to be an innovative solution to this, to protecting the teachers, uh, the single point of failure. Um, okay, um, let's, we have five minutes. <laughs> for questions if anyone else since everyone has been in a breakout room perhaps uh, that is not uh, too bad if anyone has a question uh, raise your hand or just jump in but do not leave because there's a another poll you have to fill out <laughs> yep maybe yes go on that's in here. Uh, okay. yeah, I just want to, okay. to react to what you just said. We, I didn't think of that before, but we actually do that also, especially for the first year students who are missing out on, on, on this uh, team building or, or group creation or community building. And we also encourage them because um, uh, some teachers are falling out or some, uh, some tutors. Uh, we also encourage them to keep on coming to the university. The rooms are reserved, they are there anyway. And then they just, if there's one student with a portable, just connects his portable to the projection screen and the microphone. 
and they do a kind of a, a distance, an invert, inverted uh, distance meeting <laughs> where the teacher is alone uh, behind his computer uh, at home and the students are there. And that works uh, really well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Andy, can I just say what, what one thing, I guess, I didn't, we didn't want, Arash and I didn't want to explicitly talk about it because we know Paula is giving a talk that includes mm -hmm. um, a lot on resilience, but um, we have a number of projects in, in our group on what we call socio-technical resilience and how you try and achieve resilience of your overall system, not just by technology, but by also understanding social processes. And that increasingly, if we think of resilience as something that is both social and technical, and that, we, that, that somehow um, these two have to interact with each other, then I think we're much more likely to, to have better solutions. So, so, so not only rely on the technology and not only rely on the social processes, but the, the, the appropriate combination of the two. And we do it with healthcare, we do it with policing, we do it with software development, with all mm. kinds of areas of application, I think. Interesting. We had Ivica who raised his electronic hand. Uh, okay, uh, we, we had one discussion or it was said about uh, scalability and uh, um, I, I see that actually this scalability is an opportunity today because uh, having five or 300 students in Zoom, it's, uh, it's actually easier to manage than 300 students in a room hmm. or, five, or five students. And also parallelism is probably one thing which can be uh, utilized. Uh, uh, that there are good, good opportunities for that. So, so I think there are really a lot of things which we can uh, look at how to utilize in a better way. Very nice. That's probably a very nice optimistic way to uh, face this situation. And uh, 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 conclude uh, this session. Uh, there is a poll you have to uh, fill out to give feedback on uh, this this session.